Good Morning Brew Daily Show. I am Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. And Neil, how's the early wake up been going for you? We filmed the show kind of early in the morning. You wake up really early. How's it been going for you? I, I love it. Um, I've been waking up at 5.30 a.m., setting my alarm. So hyped for the show. So much adrenaline. I don't know what to do with it, so I've been starting, honestly, swiping on Hinge <laughs> at like 5.45. Wait. Just sitting in my bed, just super hype. And, uh, yeah, I get these messages back over the past few days being like, what are you doing? Is like, it, that 6 a.m. match hits different. Is it because it's so early, or is it because you're a world-famous podcast host now? Uh, probably both. Okay. That's good. I'm glad that you're, you're finding success. Uh, we got a great show yeah. ahead of us today. We're talking about a uh, weight loss drug controversy. We get into Bill Gates's investing habits. Another unidentified object has washed up on the shore of a foreign nation. And then we're actually finishing with some trivia. I'm excited for that. I know. Let's get into it. All right, let's ride. Okay, so for readers of the newsletter this morning, they saw the top story was mm-hmm. on Ozempic. Um, it is a diabetes drug that is also doubles as a weight loss drug. So here's the controversy and why it's it's newsworthy. So basically, Ozempic is primarily used to try to treat diabetes, and now there's a shortage of it. Mm. And the main drive behind this shortage is that tons of celebrities and a lot of people on TikTok have actually been pushing it as a weight loss drug because it actually does work for both. Um, And I can get into the science of it a little bit, but Neil, have you encountered any of this Ozempic chatter on on social media in the last few days? I have not, but it it seems like the kind of thing you either know everything about or you know nothing about. And we were, I think, before this show in the I know nothing about this. Right. But luckily... We have a great uh, crew here, and Emily, our producer, sent us a bunch of TikToks of of people kind of explaining what it does. Yeah, that was a fun last night. So I'm going to break it down a little bit for our audience. Uh, Essentially, the drug works by targeting the amount of insulin produced by the pancreas, and a a byproduct of that is that it decreases the amount of glucogen produced by the liver. I know. (laughs) Toby Howell, MD. MD right here. But... The the general uh, outcome of that is that the combo of those two things reduces hunger and increases energy, okay. which is kind of the two main keys for weight loss. Um, and yeah, so let's talk about TikTok's role in this. 785 million views of the Ozempic hashtag, tons of celebrities, even Elon Musk right. on Twitter. I was going to say, it's not, just, it's not just TikTok, it's everywhere. Um, Elon Musk posts about it on Twitter. Right. He posted about a drug that he was taking because someone said, like, Elon, you're looking, you're looking good right now. What's, what's the blame for it? And he first said fasting, and then he followed up with another tweet. Um, <laughs> the real reason. The real reason, which is talking about this, this particular weight loss drug that he's been, been taking. So you can see why it's getting momentum and why doctors are finding it hard to prescribe this to the people who probably need it yeah. most. Yeah. They, I, I have the stat. U.S. doctors wrote more than 313,000 prescriptions for Ozempic in the last full week of January. That's a 78% increase from the year before. Yeah, it's that's massive. And I think the reason why it's massive is because it works as a weight loss drug. Yeah. Uh, Wigovi, which is actually the drug that Elon took, people are reporting 15 to 17% body loss. So this is not like a, a fad. It's not like uh, pseudoscience, it's true science that targets certain systems in your body that helps you lose weight. Yeah, and Eli, the Eli Lilly drug that is associated with this class of drug, uh, in a study that they ran, they uh, patients who didn't have diabetes lost up to 22.5% of their body weight after taking it for nearly 18 months. Stop. That's all. It's that is so dramatic. Sizable. I would be down to nothing if I was losing twenty percent of my body weight. I know. Skin and bones, weight. man. Um, and then the one, the one final thing that makes this story really interesting is, of course, healthcare in America is a little annoying and weird when it comes to insurance, mm. to put it lightly. Yeah. Um, but weight loss drugs are not covered by insurance, but diabetes drugs are. Yeah. And so that's why a lot of people. It's kind of like the guy who doesn't have uh, ADD who would get, like, Adderall, but just to use it to study. I don't know any of those people. (laughs) We we won't expose anyone that we know. But people are essentially doing the same thing. We're like, no, I'm not taking this for weight loss. 
even though they are taking it mm-hmm. from weight loss. So there is some like insurance arbitrage that's happening. Interesting. This is uh, this class of drugs is going to be massive for drug makers. Weight loss drugs in general. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. I think they just Eli Lilly will generate peak annual sales of ten billion from its one drug. That's according to an estimate from J.P. Morgan. So these these companies are going to lean in like crazy. Yeah, I'm just surprised that they haven't just released a differently branded instead of branding it for diabetes patients, you brand it as a weight loss drug. But I guess again, the insurance angle comes in where insurance typically doesn't cover weight loss drugs. So a lot of moving parts in this. Um, but yeah, I'm actually very glad I got to dive into kind of like yeah. this, this corner of the world. Um, and yeah, hopefully you guys learned a little bit too. Uh, we'll see how it plays out um, going forward and whether they can ramp up production. Our next story, well, you wouldn't really know about it from our walk to work here in New York City, but according to the National Weather Service, almost all of the country is experiencing some form of notable weather. I, and so I guess that's a technical term that the I National that Weather term, Service yeah. uses. But, you know, if it's notable weather, we should probably note, note it. it. Um, and yes, there's a major winter storm that is impacting a large part of the country. More than 2,000 flights have been canceled just in the past few days. Love this thing. In Wyoming, virtually every road has been impacted. <laughs> Uh, All five just, roads. I've actually just, driven on roads in Wyoming. I would figure that most winters, most roads are in Wyoming are impacted, yeah. So there are some there are some freak stuff going on. So San Francisco could get measurable snowfall, and it hasn't seen measurable snowfall and in, LA, in 47 right? years. L.A. gets snow in the mountains, but it's the first time, I, I think maybe the second time on record, that they've been issued a blizzard warning. Oh, my god! And so L.A. meteorologists are freaking out. Yeah. They're, they're like, I didn't come here to talk about blizzard warnings. Warnings. I came here to just kind of say sunny and 75 yeah. all over again. No, and I love for the people watching this on YouTube, we've been flashing a, a map up of the different kind of like heat colors that are impacting the U.S. And it is just the craziest uh, rainbow difference. Yeah, yeah. because 100. Yeah. How, how because how because be yes, DC? there is a weather, there is a cold weather storm that is affecting the northern part of the country, but in parts of the southeast, they're they're getting record temperatures. So Washington D.C. could get eighty, uh, could see eighty degrees today, which would shatter a record set in the nineteenth century. Oh my gosh! I just love how much small talk we armed our audience with, because <laughs> everyone loves talking about the weather. Now you have notable weather to discuss. So take forth those stats in. in I don't in like them. using weather as a small talk, though. What's your least and worst, or least and most favorite small talk um, Well, we were talking about this at the office a few weeks ago, and ranking like the lo- least forms of small talk, and Dan Toomey, our colleague here, was like, the wor- okay, weather is bad, but the worst is talking about the day of the week. <laughs> so just saying, like, it's Thursday. It's Thursday. Oh, just I- another Tuesday. <laughs> which I, I kind of agree with, but the weather is up there, is number two, and then sports is number three, and these are just the universal things we can talk about. Interesting. Um, do you have you heard what's going on in the Mormon church? The Mormon church is so infinitely intriguing to me, so I'm glad it's in the news again. Um, but yeah, They're probably not because uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is known as the Mormon church, and its investment manager, Insight Peak Advisors, are paying $5 million fine to the SEC to, segul- to settle regulatory charges that it hid a huge investment fund. Okay, and so- I'm talking huge. So I got this push notification on my Apple News, as I'm sure a lot of people did. And when I saw the amount that they were hiding and then the amount that they were fined, it didn't compute my brain because they're hiding 32 – they're in trouble for hiding $32 billion, and they're paying a $5 million fine. <laughs> that is – the tiniest of slaps on the wrist. Yeah, I don't, I don't quite know how the SEC calculates its fines. So Yeah, no. But let's talk about how the heck – uh, the Mormon church can amass such a, a fund. And I, for people who are unfamiliar with Mormonism, a practice in the church is tithing 10% of your annual income to the church. And we've talked about uh, Mormons in Salt Lake City in particular 
is kind of this tech hub, and yeah. a lot of very successful entrepreneurs have kind of moved there. So when you're tithing 10% of a very lucrative base, like you can quickly amass like this huge, huge fund. Huge fund, and we're talking, so there was a whistleblower that kind of exposed this whole scheme, and the scheme was that they created all these shell companies to sort of hide the scope, and that's kind of what the SEC didn't like. They created 13 different shell companies or, to hide their vast portfolio, and this portfolio at the time this whistleblower came forward, forward was worth a hundred billion dollars. Oh That's more than twice the size of the Harvard Endowment. <laughs> the Harvard Endowment is massive, and it was basically the size of the SoftBank Vision Fund. I wonder which has performed better. I would assume the, the Mormon Church has. has well, performed they better. they have some savvy investments. So I'm looking at their investments. They held uh, forty billion worth of U.S. stock. They have Timberland in the For Florida Panhandle, and they also invested in hedge funds like Ray Dalio's Bridgewater Associates. Their stock investments were mostly uh, big tech, like Mike. Microsoft, Apple, <laughs> Amazon, just, Alphabet, like pretty, yeah. pretty chill. Yeah. But I, I found this really fun thing where they actually bought GameStop stock uh, in December or in the fourth quarter of 2020, and we all know what happened in Q1 of 2021 so, with GameStop. So they rode the wave. They up. rode the wave and they sold. We don't know exactly when they sold, but at one point their stake was worth 900 percent more. Oh my gosh. Speaking of, this is actually a, a very good transition from investments made by giant mega funds. Uh, Bill Gates was in the news again. Mm -hmm. He bought a $902 million stake in Heineken uh, yesterday. A lot of questions came <laughs> so out of many this questions. because everyone's like, what? Like, does Bill Gates even like drinking? And the, the people did some digging on the internet to figure out, is Bill Gates a beer drinker? And they found a 2018 Reddit AMA, which is Ask Me Anything, where Bill Gates literally self-described as not a big beer drinker. And his quote was, when I end up at something like a baseball game, I drink a light beer to get with the vibe of all the other beer drinkers. Sorry to disappoint real beer drinkers. There's a, that's a crazy quote to me. I, I know we're getting a little He's so out of touch. But that's, that's, <laughs> like, what is that? Does he think real beer drinkers only drink IPAs or don't drink light The guy's beer? lived his entire life in Seattle, okay? <laughs> that is, okay, that probably explains That is everything. like, you know, yeah. they're drinking IPAs there. They've never heard of Coors Light or, or Bud Light, so... Yeah. But so this is an interesting investment, obviously. So we did a little digging into like some of other some other investments that Bill Gates has. His biggest holding by far is his buddy Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway. He's got ten billion in Berkshire Hathaway yeah. stock. And then it's a bunch of boring businesses, waste management, Canadian National Rail Company, Caterpillar, who makes heavy machinery. Sounds very like uh, Warren Buffett. -y. Who are we to say? It sounds yeah. very Mormon churchy, actually. Um, and then, obviously, whenever Bill Gates is in the news, the stat that I like to bring up, and I don't know, some conspiracy theorists like to bring up, is Bill Gates is actually the biggest landowner in the United States. He owns 270,000 acres of farmland. Is that a crazy stat to you? Or? It is a crazy yeah. stat. I just want to know, like, who's making these decisions, basically. Is Bill Gates, like, pouring over uh, balance sheets and figuring out what is, who, who's, where he's going to invest? Or he, he probably has a team, for sure. Right. I just want to know who, who, what, what guy was looking through Heineken's financials and was like, you know, I think Heineken is poised for massive growth. And they take it to Bill Gates. And then he's like, yep. <laughs> like, you know what? Up. I am not a beer drinker, but yeah. I like Heineken. Okay. When we make $100 from this podcast, we'll figure out how the, the world of upper levels. Yeah, I was going to ask you, so you're Bill Gates rich, right? Yeah. Uh, not yet, but not yet. in a hypothetical world, yeah. in a real world in maybe 30 years. What are, you, what are you investing in? What does your portfolio look like? I mean, the first thing that came to mind is buy a sports team. I mean, it's been in the news recently, but I can't think of anything more fun than being the owner of a sports team. You get your box, you get the parking spot. So might not be the most savvy investment, but that's what I would do. It has been a savvy investment in the past. I mean, if you bought the, in the NBA, you know, 20 years ago, right. you probably have a massive return. So I like it. All right. I want to move on to a new segment we're calling Is Toby <laughs> Bullish or Bearish? And what I'm going to do is introduce a new product feature or a new announcement from a company. And I'm just going to put it to you. You have a lot of opinions on these things. Mm -hmm. Are you bullish or are you bearish on this thing? Okay. So today we're going to talk about AI news that's not chat GPT or Ping. <laughs> or, Bing. <laughs> or Bing. Spotify released an AI-powered DJ that curates and commentates over a personalized, personalized playlist. So think of it as a radio station, but there are no commercials and the DJ is a robot. <laughs> are you, Toby, are you bullish or are you bearish on AI DJ from Spotify? I mean... 
first thing is I'm very bullish on it, actually. But it's a nuanced bullish because... Nuanced bullish. A nuanced bullish because I swear Spotify has already had recommendation algorithms running in the background. And the example I'll give is the other day, my roommates and I were cleaning our apartment. We have an Alexa that's connected to my Spotify. And my roommate goes, Alexa, play so-and-so. I don't know what song it was. And then Alexa played music for the next two hours. And by the end of it, we we're like, that was a great playlist. Like, what was that, Seth? And he's like, that wasn't me. That was Spotify just recommending songs. So I do think Spotify's recommendation algorithm is already great. I'm sure it's been using AI. Now it's branding it a little bit. But there is the component of the, the DJ host. Right. You have this guy, and we listened to it um, earlier, and he just kind of walks you through the context of the song a little bit. You know, it's kind of like an X. It reminded me of an XM radio station where they kind of inter- there's no commercials, but they interject yeah. in the middle of songs to like kind of transition you from one song to the other. Um, so this is just another example of <laughs> new age streaming platforms becoming <laughs> becoming more like the things that they replace. Right. So we've talked about streaming becoming a lot more like cable, and now Spotify is just they resembling the radio. radio. <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm bullish on this, but I'm not bullish on this for myself because yeah. I am a. I love knowing a human curated thing, something for me. Okay. So I, I listen to radio. Like I, I, I'm faced with so much choice fatigue when I open up Spotify, mm-hmm. and so that's why I like terrestrial radio. And our Philly listeners are gonna love this. But my favorite radio station when I lived in Philly was WXPN, and they have they actually in their marketing slogans and materials they really like hammer AI and algorithms. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they're, they always say something like rhythms, not algorithms, and curated, not encoded. Oh, so they're against. They're uh, against okay, it, yes. I and, I, and I'm like, I love that. I want someone who's super into music curating oh. music for so me. So you don't want to cheat on your first love by, by going to Spotify, oh, I see. I love XPN. And uh, yeah, I am, yeah, so I'm bullish because I think other people are perfectly fine with AI yeah. recommending them, but I always think there's some sinister thing going on. All right, so Toby, fully bullish, New Neil, no, Toby, nuance bullish. Nuance bullish, Neil. N- Neil also nuance bullish. Okay. I would say. I'm but sorry. this segment is not about asking me whether I'm bullish or not. Okay. Let's, just, let's just put it out there. Okay, let's jump into our final segment of the day. Uh, Neil, another unidentified object of cylindrical nature has washed up somewhere. This I don't time, know if I would call that a cylinder. This time it's not in the air. Sorry, spherical nature. You're right. Um, so the, the headline news is that a Japanese coastal town is kind of up in arms because a five-foot-in-diameter uh, ball Yeah washed up on the beach one day and of course everyone's on a little bit on edge because we've had the spy balloon controversy we've had all these unidentified objects kind of appearing places so they have identified that it is not a mine like they initially perhaps suspected which is good by the fact that it did not blow up it did not blow up. well they did send a bomb squad down to yeah. x-ray it to make sure um yeah do you, is this is this? It's well, only newsworthy because it just keeps happening. Totally, but it's kind of interesting. Yeah, the footage we're showing now shows these guys kind of inspecting it on the beach, and it's kind of baked in there. And it reminds me of the scene of an opening of like an extra extraterrestrial movie or an alien movie where something weird washes up, and you have these humans inspecting yeah. a very foreign object that they don't know what it is. But to me, it's just part of this really interesting thing where we have the James Webb's Space Telescope <laughs> taking pictures of the furthest galaxies, and we have all of this radar, GPS technology. We think we know everything about the world and the galaxies, and yet there's still all this random stuff showing up that we don't know what it is, and it's kind of spooking us. Yeah, the ocean spits out untold The ocean forest. is a lot, yeah. yeah. But I, it was also reminding me of those obelisks that appeared, remember, early oh in COVID? Gosh. Yeah. That, all over the... Did that end up being a marketing stunt, or was that just... Oh, I don't probably. remember. Yeah. So maybe this is a marketing stunt, I know. Stunt We're so too. cynical at this point. We don't even know. We had... Oh, this thing is crazy. I mean, we had a... We, the U.S. military... Shot down a twelve dollar hobby balloon with a four hundred and thirty thousand sidewinder <laughs> missile. We're on edge. We're on edge. Okay, we're, we're on, on edge. edge. So I don't know if we'll ever figure out what the this the spherical object is. I think it's just a buoy. If we're being for sure, if we're gonna dampen it, it looks like a buoy. But it was fun to to see people kind of freaking out about it a little bit. All right. Uh, so Toby t- Toby teased at the top that we're gonna end with a little puzzle or trivia and. 
I'm going to that because a bunch of you have called us dorks in the comments, and we're just that that is You're absolutely right. true. Right. Yes. So we're just going to lean into that. Uh, Toby, you want to tell us how uh, this is going to work? Yeah. So we were kind of reminiscing about the good old days of HQ trivia when everyone in the office would kind of gather around a phone and try to win a trivia competition. Obviously, the show isn't live, but we would love to give you a trivia question and have you kind of work on it throughout the next two days with your friends. If you work remotely, send it in the Slack channel. But we want you to put your brains together and work collaboratively on this riddle that Neil is about to give you. Yeah, this one's from The Guardian, and hopefully it doesn't take you too long, uh, but it might take you, uh, you know, a few minutes or an hour or so. Um, and here it is. It goes, in quotes, I'm going to read a sentence, and the sentence goes, this sentence contains blank letters, okay? You're going to try to write a number out in words in the blank space, in the blanks, in the above sentence that will make this statement true. Okay, so I would say, like, this sentence contains 97 right. letters. That is not the correct answer. Not the correct but answer. But that is just And I would possible. write out yeah. 97. Right, with an N and stuff, yeah. And then the number would have to match the letters. Okay, I see. Yeah. There's layers to it, then. No, it's a really good trivia question. Yeah. Or it's not really a trivia question, but it is a puzzle. A riddle. And so work on it over the course of the day. Okay, and then how do our listeners submit their answers to Well, this is a good point to bring up that we have a email inbox. Let's go. Obviously, because we're Morning Brew, yeah. and we live in email, and it's morningbrewdaily at morningbrew.com. And uh, we, <laughs> so send it in, and uh, we will uh, review your answers and say you got it right. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm excited to kind of interact with the audience a little bit. Uh, I know. Hopefully, also, you don't just have to email us about the, the trivia question. You can just give us show feedback or just say hi because we'll be checking the inbox. Totally. All right. That's it for today. Uh, big day tomorrow. Yeah. Let's I run it back why. tomorrow. <laughs> Toby's turning 26 tomorrow. That's kind of what I was talking I know. about. I'm getting old. I'm getting old. All right. Well, that's it from us. We just want to give a huge shout out to our crew back in the control room. The show's producer and editor is Emily Trust the Process Mill Iron. The show's technical director is Joe Hampton. Our supervising producer is Bryce Belloff. VP of Tech and Operations with a new promotion is Dan Bauza. And De Devin Emery is our chief content officer. And our show is a production of Morning Brew. We'll run it back tomorrow.